so today I will be discussing uh, phenomenology theory uh, about the types of magnetism uh, and the real system which can measure the magnetic properties of the material. Then we will go to the central labs and perform the demonstration on one of the systems. Okay, discussing about type of magnetism, how a magnetic material will behave in the magnetic field determines the type of magnetism inside the material. There are five categories which are diamagnetic, uh, paramagnetism, uh, paramagnetism, anti-ferromagnetism and perimagnetism. Talking about diamagnetism, diamagnetism is the fundamental property of every material but it is a very weak property. So what happens in a diamagnetic material, uh, all the magnetic movements of electrons are oriented so that they cancel one another. Okay, so they cancel one another and the system is left with no net magnetic movement. So when you place such a material inside a magnetic uh, field, the effective movement of the system decreases. This is what we call the diamagnetism. Okay, uh, in a crude way, you can say if an atom has its shells filled such that uh, all of the electrons are paired, there is no unpaired electron left inside the system, then it is called the diamagnetism. So, this is the reason all the noble gases are diamagnetic in nature. Uh, I said crude way because we have to be careful uh, because in some materials, uh, there are uh, net magnetic movement of the system, but they are still diamagnetic like, like copper. Copper has a configuration like 3D10 4S1. So there is one unpaired electron inside the copper, but it is still diamagnetic. This is because other uh, players come into the play inside the copper like metallic bonding of the uh, electron inside the system. So. Uh, Apart from noble gases, uh, hydrogen, the atomic molecule or nitrogen, they are also diamagnetic in nature. Talking about paramagnetism, uh, we have discussed it in detail. Uh, paramagnetism occurs when there is partial cancellation of the net magnetic movements. So partial, can uh, partial cancellation means that system has still uh, magnetic movement when this happens, the system could be para or ferromagnetic. In paramagnetism, the magnetic movements of all the system is weakly coupled to each other. So thermal agitation causes a random alignment of the system as you can see uh, in figure A. If there is no applied field, all the magnetic movements of the system are uh, randomly aligned in random direction. So when you apply a magnetic field, uh, what happens, a small fraction, a small fraction of these spins will get aligned inside the direction of the magnetic field. So, in 1895, Curie experimentally observed that uh, the susceptibility of these materials behave as 1 over T. Uh, the behavior of this susceptibility, which is the variation of magnetization with the applied field, was unexplained until 1905 where Langevin gave his theory of the localized magnetic movement. Okay, so the examples of uh, paramagnetism are uh, magnesium, sodium, uh, oxygen, diatomic molecule of oxygen, this is also paramagnetic. Their uses of diamagnetic and paramagnetic materials are very limited because they had no permanent magnetic movement. So, uh, diamagnetism corresponds to the negative magnetization, paramagnetic material has a positive magnetization. When you mix these two material, there is a point uh, at which the susceptibility becomes zero. So for diamagnetic material, susceptibility is less than zero, for paramagnetic it is greater than zero. So you mix the material, you mix the concentration of uh, right amount of diamagnetic and paramagnetic and the susceptibility will become zero. So there is no response of the material to the magnetic material, uh, to, uh, to the applied magnetic field. So uh, next we are talking about the ferro and anti-ferromagnetism. We have discussed it in lectures, the origin of uh, 
ferromagnetism and anti-ferromagnetism lies in the exchange interaction. The system is strongly coupled to each other. So when the exchange constant J greater than zero, then the system will prefer to be oriented in parallel spin configuration. So when the system, when the uh, exchange constant is less than zero, the system will prefer to uh, exhibit itself in anti-parallel spin configuration. Uh, the examples of uh, uh, ferromagnetic materials are iron, nickel, cobalt, and uh, antiferromagnetism is first observed in uh, manganese oxide. So this is the type. These are the types of the uh, magnetic materials. Uh, now we can uh, think of the real system which can measure the properties of this system. What are the real system which can measure these properties of system? Uh, like susceptibility and the magnetization of the system. Okay, so one of the many system is the vibrating sample magnetometer. The idea was put forward by S. Fodor in 1955. The idea is quite simple. Uh, we have electromagnets over here. These are the electromagnets which provide a uniform magnetic field. The four blue boxes represent the primary coil and secondary coil. This is also known as the sensing coil. Uh, another picture of the sensing coil is over here. Primary and secondary coils. Okay. So the above is the vibration unit which moves the sample inside the magnetic field in vertical direction. Okay. So what happens when you put a sample inside this magnetic field, the sample gets magnetized. When it gets magnetized, it will have its own magnetic field. This magnetic field is also known as the magnetic stray field. So then we allow the sample to move vertically inside this magnetic field. So when this happens, there is a changing magnetic field inside the system of the sample actually. There is a changing magnetic field of the sample which will produce and induce EMF in the sensing coil. If you see over here, here is the uh, uh, view of the sample and its dipolar field. So when it vibrates, it induces an EMF according to the Faraday law. Okay. So this EMF is fed to the lock-in amplifier uh, and we get the magnetization. So this is as simple as the basic working of the vibrating sample magnetometer. So how we detect this signal? Uh, we use the lock-in detection scheme. Uh, the lock-in detection scheme is uh, you lock the signal at a particular frequency. Locking, what does locking do? It lock the signal at a particular frequency. Then the signal output signal from the sensing coil goes to the lock-in amplifier. It gets amplified and it is multiplied with the reference signal. Okay. So when it gets multiplied with the reference signal, you can extract your very small signal uh, from the uh, buried in the noise. You can extract the signal uh, from noise. So uh, this is what the lock-in detection scheme. Uh, how this happens, it comes from the mathematics. If you have, uh, uh, I can show you uh, how this happens. Say you have a signal you have a reference signal, say the vibrator is sinusoidally uh, vibrating the sample. So it has an amplitude, okay. So uh, let this call V naught, then it is vibrating sine of omega naught is also the frequency at which the vibrator is moving, omega naught T plus there should be, there should be a uh, phase attached to this signal. So this is our reference signal. So what have now the sensing coil uh, sends a signal which is also have a form say V uh, VL is equal to V signal sign of at a different frequency say we assume that this is a uh, different frequency omega R T plus theta signal. Okay. So what does locking do? 
lock in multiplies this signal <coughs> lock in first lock in sends this signal then it multiplies this signal with the reference signal and what we get v out So this is the signal you get when you apply the identity. So this signal is then fed to the low pass filter. These are two AC signals, two different AC signals at a different frequency. So this is the, uh, okay. So when you pass it through the low pass filter, what will you get? You will get the thing. So there is an interesting thing happening over here. If this frequency omega r, which is the signal frequency that is equal to the omega naught, which is actually the case we are doing uh, in the VSL. So what will happen, the output would be if omega r is equal to omega naught, then v output would be 1 by 2 v naught v signal cos of theta signal minus theta delta. So this is what we get. This frequency will be rejected because we pass it through the low pass filter. So the difference of the frequency, uh, low pass filter will only let go the frequency which are equal to this uh, reference signal or the uh, output signal of our system. So this is how we get, this is a very good signal which we can get from the lock-in detection scheme. So this is uh, what we are doing. Uh, there is a supply to the uh, uh, electromagnets uh, to change the magnetic field because we want to uh, see how the system behaving in the changing magnetic field. So then we measure the magnetization, uh, the signal from the sensing coil. Next, I will show you some results. Uh, these are the results obtained in the VSM, in the, which is present in the central lab. So here is a graph of the nickel bulb, uh, which is uh, given the saturation magnetization of 52 AMU per gram, uh, which is in well agreement with the experiment. On the right side, there is a thermal alloy, thin film, thermal alloy is a nickel iron alloy, and the thickness of thin film is approximately 21 nanometer, and we get a very smooth ferromagnetic Curve, soft magnet, it is a soft magnet behavior of the system. So, if you notice that the units are EMU per gram on one side and the EMU per cc on the other side. So, EMU per gram is the CBS uh, unit which is the magnetization per unit mass while the thin film is the magnetization per unit volume. So, we use different because in bulk samples we can measure the mass of the system uh, accurately uh, while the volume is uh, difficult to measure in the bulk samples. While in thin films, we have to measure the volume of the thin film. So you have to measure the uh, so dimension of the substrate upon which you have sputtered the uh, thin film and then you also have to know the thickness of the thin film to measure the volume of the uh, thin film. This is the graph uh, uh, of 
same film, Parmalai film, uh, but I have chosen this to show you that I made a comment that every material is diamagnetic in nature, but it is a very weak effect. So you can see uh, when the field is about 0.5 Tesla, which is 500 Oster, the system is saturated. System is saturated about over here, about 10 Oster, 20 Oster uh, field. System, system gets saturated. Then you increase the magnetic field. What happens? The diamagnetic response of the silicon tends to appear in the system. So what is the diamagnetic response? You apply a magnetic field in one direction and the movement start decreasing. So uh, this explains uh, the curve from here, over here, this explains that you are applying a negative field and the magnetization is increasing. Same is over here, you are applying a positive field and the magnetization is decreasing. So this is the diamagnetic response of the silicon substrate upon which we have deposited our thin film. So you can notice the thin film is only 21 nanometer while the substrate would be in 4 by 5 millimeter square. Okay, uh, if you do uh, not have any question then we will go to the central labs and perform the demonstration on the VSM. Okay.